Hello, and welcome to our first conversation of the Behind the Screen series. Please feel free to use the chat box to share reactions, comments, or any questions you may have for our guest speaker. And also, reach out to our customer support team if you run into any troubles during the event. For best viewing experience, please refer to the handout attached in the chat box. Now, our founder and moderator for today, the amazing Garland Thompson, will introduce our guest. Hello, everybody out there in virtual Zoom land. Good afternoon. It's a Friday afternoon here in Southern, well, not Southern California, Northern California. Uh, kind of a sunny, sunny, beautiful day out here in California. And I would like to welcome you to our very first virtual live event as part of our series Behind the Screen, interesting conversations with, with artists and innovative people. Uh, my name is Garland Thompson. I am your host. I'm the CEO and founder of Zoom Catchers. Zoom Catchers is a company I founded last summer uh, when we were just in the beginning of the pandemic. And I was sitting around my house one day while some workers were doing some remodeling and stuff on the house just kind of after we finally were able to get that going again. And I began to think about all the Zoom meetings that I'd been on and this thing called Zoom fatigue and all of that. And I began to just think about how it is that Zoom fatigue comes about. And I think it comes about by all the little glitches and things that happen. People unmuting or not muting their microphone, talking, talking, you see them talking, but you don't hear them or anything like that. Um, so I thought there's got to be a better way. And coming from theater, uh, our approach, of course, when you do a play, when you produce a play, you have a cast and you have a crew, you have your actors and you have your technicians. Why? Because uh, actors cannot run the lights while they are trying to give you this incredible soliloquy or scene that they're playing. By the same token, technicians are and, and designers, they are not uh, actors, they're not performers, their work is done through the technology, through lighting. So either both needs the other. So I thought, why not take that approach towards running Zooms? And so I created this company, I got the idea, Zoom Catchers, just sort of popped into my head, one of those epiphany-like moments, and kind of uh, based on the wordplay of, with dream catchers. So I thought, wow, we're, we're, we are kind of catching dreams, but we're, we're catching Zooms, Zoom dreams. So that's what we're here to do. So, and uh, one of the things we thought we'd like to do is, of course, we all know how divided the nation has been, both pre-election and post-election. You know, we all watched an insurrection happen in the Capitol. Uh, we watched an inauguration. We have a new administration and all of that. So it's all been kind of crazy. So we felt here at Zoom Catchers that it's uh, up to folks like us everybody really to sort of help smooth things out and help deal with all that chaos. So we thought one way that we could contribute was to sit down and have conversations with interesting and innovative people who are not letting things like the pandemic stop them. So that's why we're here today with Behind the Screen presented to you by Zoom Catchers. It's a real pleasure. Uh, our guest today is the amazing, the wonderful, the fantastic, I can't come up with enough words to describe how, good, how cool she is, Catherine Cross. Catherine, we're going to find out about her. She is a dear friend of ours. She is, uh, works with us. She's also our special advisor here at Zoom Catchers, but we'll talk more about that later. Let's go ahead and uh, bring Catherine in and say hello to Catherine. Catherine. Hi. Come on in. Let me, let's let you in. There you are. How are you doing, Catherine? <laughs> good, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thank you. You look lovely today. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're ready for a photo shoot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, camera ready. So uh, for our audience out there, uh, Catherine, I'll just uh, run down a couple of quick things and we'll get into it a little more. You're, you're a number of things, uh, not the least of which is an entrepreneur. And that's how I first met you in your entrepreneurial <laughs> work with the company you founded called Bridge Strategy, a consulting company. Uh, you're also a model. A professional model and uh you are also a podcaster so yes there's a few different things you're doing there let's let's start to unpack that let's um why don't you tell us about your current occupation yeah so i am full-time working as a product designer as well um so i'm working at a company called publicis sapien it's a tech consultancy and there we help our clients redesign user interfaces 
and reimagine the experience of their products. So my official title is an experience designer. Um, so that can entail anything from their in-person experience to the online product experience. Um, so I do that. And then um, after I finish the work day full time, then I work on my other projects that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that, because I, I, I think I've heard the term experiencification. Maybe I'm just making that up. I think <laughs> I've heard that before. Um, but in the sense of people are, are much more interested these days, it seems like in experiences. Ex experience has become a much more important thing than it seems in the past. Is that true? Yeah, I definitely think so, especially as Silicon Valley has seen a growth in different technologies um, that people have been able to develop a niche for themselves within a market by having a really unique experience. And so I think Apple is seen as the pioneer of user experience and perfecting that process. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think with that, even the experience of things like when you open an Apple product, it ha takes a few seconds because there's friction in the box and it's supposed to build anticipation for the user. Um, so even very mm -hmm. subtle features like that, I think, make the user experience what it is. And so I think more companies are trying to hone their own user experience and make it optimized and unique because there's so many other players in every industry trying to perfect it as well. Was Apple the pioneer in that? Were they the first ones that, to, that, to your knowledge, were they the first ones to introduce that? Or were there other folks in the arena trying to play around with that as well? Um, I think that they were may not necessarily have been the first, but I think they're the biggest name brand affiliated with user experience because Steve Jobs really tried to focus on that whenever they were doing product development. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's it's certainly come through because I uh, clearly, I mean, the iPhone is the number one selling phone, I believe, in the world. <laughs> And yeah. there's, there's a reason for that, and everybody else is copying them. But mm -hmm. well, that's Apple, and that's Steve Jobs. Enough of them. But um, so that's that. That sounds like. I mean, is that is that a job that you're really, like, really has you engaged all day long, and you're walking <laughs> out going like, wow, or are you just like, man, okay, enough of that. I'm going to go design my own experience now. Yeah, um, it, it definitely is fulfilling. I learn a lot about kind of client work and understanding. Um, how to do design and being able to practice it. But I think um, I really like to stay busy. So that's why I have all of these other projects um, that I think continue my fulfillment. So I'm really interested in fashion and that's where my modeling and podcast comes in um, and entrepreneurship as well. So um, I think my love for meeting new people and helping businesses, understanding value props and things of that nature really come through when I'm able to work on bridge strategy. Mm -hmm. And that is a perfect segue right into bridge <laughs> strategy because <laughs> that's that's what I wanted to talk to you about next because that's actually how you and I first met. Uh, we met through your company, Bridge Strategy. For our listeners out there, our, our audience, Bridge Strategy is a company that, um, that Catherine founded uh, and it is a consulting company, and it's meant to help uh, businesses and startups. Uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. So hopefully, I'll get the, the pitch right. It's meant to start up, help businesses and startups uh, kind of find their way, get their footing, and help uh, help them strategize first as they build their business. Is that a fair approximation? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So we met, uh, we, uh, uh, Kimberly Gunn, our executive director here at Zoom Catchers, uh, is a Wellesley graduate and she's in touch with the, with the college and does, does alumni things with the college and what have you, uh, and, and found out about their internship program, internship program and thought, what a fabulous thing to do. Let's, let's get some interns from Wellesley. And by the way, this is a paid internship, which is the thing that turned us on. We didn't want, we weren't interested in any kind of, unpaid internship but uh it was through that and so uh through interfacing with wellesley and looking on their job boards etc and information boards she found catherine and brought catherine on board and and uh, talked me into hiring the team and i'm so glad i did because she brought us a great team tell us a little bit about bridge and, and what you do and how you do it 
Yeah. So Bridge Strategy is a management and marketing consultancy. So we can address things like pricing strategy, as well as any marketing concerns. So that can entail social media help and things of that nature. Um, so it's been pretty good. We've started in June and we've been able to help about 28 clients since then across different industries, as well as some nonprofits. We've done pro bono work. Um, so it's been really great because I've been able to meet a lot of our clients and really understand their business and how they operate, as well as be able to witness kind of professional development amongst our consultants. Um, so I think both have been really rewarding and especially getting to know consultants. I think I graduated in June from Wellesley, so I wasn't sure if I would have kind of continued contact with the students there, but I think it was a really good way to continue to get to know what's happening at Wellesley um, and be able to kind of stay in touch with the community and help in any way that I can. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you all catch that out there? She just graduated, not just, but she <laughs> recently graduated from Wellesley. She's only 22. Catherine's only 22 and really got so much that you're doing. It's 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 really amazing. This team, tell me a little bit about the team, because I my experience with the team was just really wonderful. You brought together, I think we had about five or six of five or six, right, folks that we yeah. met with, right, on a regular basis. And they were all, the diversity was wonderful. And they just uh, they were just, it, it was like I was dealing with experts, even though they are still in school, et cetera, et cetera. It was like I was dealing with top-notch experts. So uh, tell me, tell me a little bit about them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have about 50 consultants in a Google group that I'm able to touch base with whenever we acquire a client. And so for the Zoom Captures project, um, I just pitched as I normally do with our consultants and then gauge interest. And then from there was able to staff a team. Um, and I think Zoom Catchers was really unique because there were kind of across the board things that we could help out with. Um, so one of them being pricing and we had done pricing a couple of times in the past, but not too extensively. Um, we had never done um, like, that the actual pricing strategy we had done kind of pricing verification in the past so i think it was important to me that our team had people on board that were familiar with pricing and able to be dedicated to the research required to complete that strategy um so yeah it was really awesome to compile a team that was all really diligent and dedicated and i think also really cared about zoom catcher's mission um and being able to stay in touch with you and the team at Zoom Catchers as well. We really enjoyed uh, enjoyed working with you guys and very much want to keep in touch as, as well. I'm curious, what was when you first heard about Zoom Catchers? And I guess it was Kim, Kimberly, the first you spoke spoke to originally and found out about. When you first heard, when the team first heard about Zoom Catchers, what we were trying to, what did you guys think? Were you like, oh my God, they're crazy or, or what? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. I think people that have made businesses that are in tune with what's happening in the world in terms of the pandemic, are really quite scrappy for doing so because um, even though things really started ramping up with the pandemic last March, I think, um, I mean, it takes time to develop a business and to also have the gumption to execute a business idea. So I really admire anyone that was really reactionary and then proactive um, in addressing the new issues that were arising as a result of the pandemic. We, you know, it's a funny thing because now that you, I hear you say it, <laughs> you put it that way, I, I do think, wow, I guess that really was kind of a crazy thing. <laughs> I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic and you want to start a business? It's like yeah. a that's that's never existed in an area that you're still getting familiar with yourself and what have mm -hmm. you. I mean, it just, you know, when you say it out loud like that, it seems a little crazy, um, <laughs> but it just, it did feel like an epiphany, you know, when I, when I did it. And it was, it was literally one of those things, Catherine, when I first thought of it, I was like, I thought of it, the name popped into my head, Zoom Catchers, and immediately I thought, let me get the website, let me get the web domain name. So I got that. And then the next day I was like, oh my God, I got to file a business because if I have a website and somebody else comes up with the name and steals it and what have you, then, then I'm done. So I got, so, but it was like that. It was like, that. Yeah. I just knew like that and out came the card and you know, there we go. So, um, 
but it does sound a little, like I said, coming <laughs> it does sound a little interesting. Uh, yeah. But you guys, and so what did the team think about us and think about Zoom catchers and what we were trying to do? Yeah, I think they felt similarly. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to staff a team unless they were really passionate about the mission too. Um, so when I had initially pitched the client project to everyone, um, I think a lot of them thought similarly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now tell us if you would tell us just a, briefly a little bit about the, some of the folks in your team, because you've got quite a diverse team and I think it really speaks to you as a, as a, as a business owner yourself and as a manager and as someone who can bring together people from diverse backgrounds with all sorts of different skill sets to do something like this, to focus. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think I got pretty lucky because at a certain point, it just became word of mouth uh, as to how we were recruiting new consultants. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people would tell their friends about it. And I think um, especially because it was the summer right after the pandemic, um, or kind of during the pandemic, I guess, a lot of people were left without internships or internships that had been canceled. So they were really looking for things to do um, and opportunities to take on. So I think I got lucky in that regard because there were a lot of people that were really willing to put in time. Um, but I actually wish that it was a bit more diverse. I think at the onset, we started pro bono. Um, and so we weren't able to pay consultants because I wanted to help out small businesses that were really struggling. Mm -hmm. um, but then it had me thinking about kind of the ramifications of unpaid work. And I think mm -hmm. there's a certain barrier um, to diversity when there's unpaid work involved, um, just because I think it limits kind of low income people from participating. And there's a lot of intersectional implications with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I think it, at the beginning, it wasn't as diverse as I wish it could have been. And I think there's still a bit more room for improvement, but um, mm -hmm. for what it was, I think it was good. What are, what are some of the other, what other kinds of businesses did, uh, did you and Bridge work with? Yeah, we worked with um, a lot of consumer goods businesses. Um, so things like a candle making company um, mm -hmm. and an apothecary. Um, we reached into healthcare a bit. One of my um, friends had a connection to a clinic. So they were opening up and needed help kind of gauging their market um, because they were opening up in an area that wasn't really densely populated. Um, so yeah, things of that nature. We had quite a few industries represented, but I think for the most part, the majority, I think it was about 22% was in the consumer mm. goods sector. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. What's a, what's a sector or business or an area that you, that you like that really fascinates you? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think definitely consumer goods. Um, I think especially running bridge strategy, I realized kind of the difference between running a product versus a service, because when I was operating a service oriented business, I had to personally shape every offering that we had, whereas a product can be kind of one standard product and then it's a one for all model instead of one for one. Um, so I think those kind of um, business interactions I really reflected on. And so I, I think in the future, I'll probably look into kind of a one for all product type of model um, mm -hmm. because I think that I'm really interested in kind of Gen Z social norms and stuff like that. And I think especially Gen Z consumes quite a few products and is really mm -hmm. on the brink of a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you looking to start another business now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. yeah, I am. Um, so currently I'm living in an entrepreneurship kind mm -hmm. of hacker house. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's quite a few other founders here. So I think I, I moved in about two weeks ago and I was really looking for inspiration. Um, I'm really interested in fashion, entertainment. Um, and so we have had things like hackathons and I've been able to meet quite a few other founders as well. Um, and so we've been brainstorming ideas. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. now, now tell us a little bit about, about Launch House for the, for the listeners out there. And then I'm going to, I'm going to show a video. <clears throat> I'll show a video of you. You, <laughs> you were kind enough to uh, do a little walk through the, through the house and look pretty nice. So, but yeah, tell us yeah. a little bit about the Launch House program. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> Launch House started, this is their third house. So every 
um, month. They have been switching locations, but I think this house in particular, they plan on staying in for a couple more months. Um, so they're trying to make it quite a long-term operation. So there are three founders. Um, I actually found out about it on Twitter. And so I applied through that. Um, but I think it's really amazing because there's about 25 people living here. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone is in the startup space in some capacity, either working at a VC or um, has started a company themselves that later got acquired or is currently working on building out a company. And everyone here, I think the oldest person is 31. So um, it's really crazy to see such young people that are also really accomplished. Um, mm -hmm. Like one of my roommates is 21 and she sold a company last year. So um, just being able to meet people like that, I think is really inspiring. And initially I almost even felt imposter syndrome um, mm -hmm. because there were so many people that were so accomplished, but um, I think just being able to make friends with them and get to know them on a personal level has kind of made me see that um, like no matter how accomplished you are, if you're a good person, then that's kind of what matters. So I've been able, but I think I've been fortunate that everyone here is a good person and really accomplished. So, <laughs> so it's <Right>. been good. <laughs> that helps a lot when, yeah. when, 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 when folks are nice. What would, I'm curious, what would for you, what would, uh, uh, what accomplishment, I mean, what, what do you think you would have had needed to not feel imposter syndrome like what kind of for you what kind of accomplishment would count i mean you mentioned the young woman who sold a the, who sold a company i don't know mm -hmm. for how much but i mean if you sold a company for half a million dollars or million dollars, would that be you know you know what i'm saying um yeah i think it's honestly just that i'm not that well versed in the vc space and i think mm -hmm. even with the territory of selling a company and things like that they usually become accustomed to the VC space and just kind of the jargon. So when I first got here, I think it was just a little bit jarring because I had never really been in a space where people were always talking about valuations and investing um, and who is starting what new fund and which funds are hiring. Um, so I think it, it's, it was just a bit of a learning curve and I think I'm still learning more mm -hmm. about that world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if I was just a bit more well versed in that space, I may have felt a little bit better. But but I'm glad I'm here to learn. Now you've been here about you've been there about two weeks, and the program is how long? It's a month. Is that it? Yeah, it's supposed to be four weeks. Um, mm -hmm. So I came a week late, and then I stayed for three weeks. Uh, or I, I plan on staying for three weeks. But there's a couple of people that are staying, extending their stay longer than they had initially planned. So. Um, I don't you know. I, do I could pretend, yeah, I could potentially do that. Um, oh, I think, the, yeah, the environment's really inspiring. So I might. How does, uh, how does for folks listening, how does one uh, get involved with Launch House? Where would you find out about that? And, and is it strictly for people, say, you know, younger people, folks in their 30s or younger, or is this open to anybody? Yeah, I think it's open to anyone. Um, their website is launchhouse.co. So you can apply through the website um, and then they interview people. But um, I, I think there, are, there aren't any restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I asked once I got here what kind of things they look for in the interview. And they said um, the main piece of criteria that they have is that they try to think about if the person they're speaking with and interviewing is in the top 10% of whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what they tried to keep in mind as they were reaching out to people because I think they didn't necessarily want to house solely full of founders um, mm -hmm. but they wanted people who just had an interest in the house because I think the diversity just creates a really great offering and so they didn't necessarily want only entrepreneurs but they were just asking themselves is this person kind of the best in whatever they're doing um, or mm -hmm. one of the best and then mm -hmm. kind of what else they could offer. Sounds like something, it sounds like a program that's also geared towards uh, elevating the field in, in general, if you will. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think because um, it, they didn't necessarily mean for it to be this way, but I think just mm -hmm. because of the nature of a co-living situation, people are really willing to support one another. So I think mm -hmm. even over the course of the past two weeks that I've been here, I've seen a lot of people angel invest in one another's companies. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of just help them with their business plan um, 
and things like that. So I think, yeah, any of those kind of things, it's definitely uplifting one another. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, why don't we take a little walk through the house now? Because you provided <laughs> us, <laughs> you provided us a very cool little video. So I'm gonna let's go ahead and and find your your video, and then we'll come back and chat a little bit more about that. Hi everyone. So this is the tour of Launch House. Um, so this is kind of the co-working space here, or a part of it. This is one of the companies whose founders are living in the house currently. And over here we can see the living room and a further co-working space. And so people during the day and night just kind of work around here and look out onto the views of LA as well as our really nice pool. So it's definitely a really good place to work and brainstorm, be inspired. So as you can see here, the pool is definitely really nice and good for our weekend activities. And this is the view. Wow. It's definitely one of a kind. Wow, that's something. That is that that's pretty cool. Now, now let me ask you about this because we are in the middle of a pandemic. So, how was all of that? How was all the COVID and all that stuff handled there? It's yeah, yeah. So they they partnered with a COVID uh, rapid tester. So mm -hmm. they have rapid tests at the door um, for when people kind of go in and out. And mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, they limit guests and. They also um, kind of discourage the sort of in and out, like going around and um, doing things. So, yeah, so I, I think it's it's hard to contain for sure. Um, and so I've mm -hmm. tried to discuss with the founders about how to kind of better their policy and such. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they're trying their best given the circumstances. Yeah, it's tough because uh, I mean I'm in the I'm in also in the film industry. I am so mm -hmm. I work with folks in the film business, and the film business has been hit really hard. Production has is still um, just coming back at a trickle, in part because of all the COVID regulations that one has to follow now. They are, they've added a whole other level of cost and and uh, that uh, not just cost but time and management and people that. Um, that a lot of companies aren't able to handle right now. So, right. So that's a that that's a tough one for a lot of folks. But yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah. So they they try to regulate it. So we all everyone in the house gets tested uh, at the end of each week. Um, mm -hmm. So there's at least some sort of consistent check in. Um, but I think it definitely is difficult given that there's so many people. But um, I actually got vaccinated yesterday and I'm the fifth person in the house to get vaccinated. So mm -hmm. I, I was just there. about to ask, <laughs> yeah, I was just about to ask if uh, you guys had access to vaccinations yet. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I do because normally I live with my brother who has cerebral palsy and my grandpa who has dementia. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, registered as an IHSS worker um, and able to get it through that. Got it. Got it. So you're you're technically you are well, actually you are kind of a frontline worker. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. You're, you know, because you're dealing with your family. I I definitely understand that. I'm a caregiver for my 93 year old aunt, so I, mm. I understand the things that you have to do to keep keep your loved ones safe. Right. So that's really beautiful too. I did not know that. That's really beautiful that you take care of your family like that. <laughs> Yeah, well, we have uh, my mom in the house, um, and then we have another caretaker, too, because um, it's quite a bit. My brother can't walk or talk, so um, mm -hmm. he requires especially a lot of care. But, um, yeah, my mom is pretty busy, so my nanny and I kind of do what we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, it's, it's tough. No, you have, to, you have to have help. It's very few people, can, families can handle this on their own. Um, yeah, so For that's sure. that, that's really wonderful that you that you have hope. Um, what is a, before we leave Launch House? I'm just curious. What is a typical day at Launch House look like? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I usually get up at around seven or eight um, because my team works out of New York City. 
So they're, um, they're gracious enough about my hours where I don't have to start at 9am EST because that's six here. But um, sometimes I have so but typically I wake up at seven or eight and then um, check emails and hop on a few calls for my work. And then I go downstairs into the co-living space that you saw on that video. And a lot of other people are on calls um, and just kind of, yeah, working through the day. Um, and then my day usually ends at four or five um, with my product design job. And then after that, I kind of work on either bridge strategy or something affiliated with my podcast or modeling, um, any of my sort of side hustles. And then there's usually, in, I would say maybe like once every three days, there's an activity in launch house. Like they have a speaker um, and, or they have a hackathon going or someone kind of giving a lecture over Zoom or things like that. Um, so we're able to listen to that and learn there. Um, and then at night, there's usually games. A lot of people play Catan. Um, and then I myself Twitch stream. So I play chess and I'll stream that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think you're muted. Oops, see here, I'm a victim of my own, uh, victim of my, I need my own service here. Um, um, th I'm glad you brought up Twitch because that's something I wanted to ask you about as well. Twitch, for those of you out there listening, Twitch is uh, one of those new crazy networks that uh, <laughs> that all the kids are going gaga about, <laughs> right? Uh, but it's another platform um, uh, like Discord and, and other platforms. And it uh, was developed originally for gamers, as far as I know, originally mm -hmm. for gamers, but it since has turned into a platform that all sorts of different folks are using for all sorts of different things. And you, I love what you're doing <laughs> because you're doing something that at first blush might be like, what? But it really works. You're playing chess on Twitch. Yeah. You're playing yeah. chess now and, and you're live streaming it like the gamers do when they're doing World of Warcraft and blowing stuff up and what have you, you're pulling, you're pulling, you know, you're pulling like three, three move counter moves and what have you on the chess table. <laughs> so how does, how, how does that work? Are you playing somebody else? Are you playing against the computer? And, and you've gotten fans now too. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, not, not too many, but um, yeah, it's kind of funny actually this week. Um, I, so I have a discord server um, so it's similar to sort sort of group chat of sorts mm -hmm. for people that view my Twitch streams. And someone mm -hmm. actually hacked it earlier this week um, and deleted <laughs> all of my content. So yeah, as, as as many I think with any kind of form of exposure, there's always going to be someone that um, adds kind of a Haters. sprinkle of negativity. So one of my Haters. friends had to really yeah, one of my friends had to moderate that. Um, but for the most part, I play. I usually start off my streams playing computers, so bots. Um, online, but then um, as people view my content, they'll pitch in the chat and then uh, challenge me. And so I'll play viewers. Um, and then I've met some people through Twitch who have viewed my content and they'll message me on my Discord. And then sometimes we'll play against one another. Or I've also played with my friends. Um, I've played with some people in Launch House. So um, yeah, it's really across the board, but I try to stay pretty consistent with chess because I find that I get the best engagement when I play that game. Mm -hmm. And now, and also now you have recently, because of the number of viewers you've been able to get up to, uh, you were telling me recently that you've been able to now monetize it to uh, yeah. at least a little bit, get something back for your time. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, it's, I mean, it's not too much, but people can subscribe to your channel as opposed mm -hmm. to just following you and so mm -hmm. when they subscribe they get certain perks like access to um, certain chat channels and mm -hmm. they also can view my content without any ads mm -hmm. um, and so I have a few subscribers so Twitch takes 50% of the subscription fees and then I take the other 50 mm -hmm. um, and then I also have um, a lot of streamers have donation buttons so for things like new equipment um, or mm -hmm. things like that, if viewers feel like funding it, then they can PayPal. So I've gotten a bid from that too. Have you? <laughs> I, I was watching one of your one of your streams, and uh, you, it was funny because you were 
you were talking about your computer, how old oh, your yeah. computer is. And what, have, have you got any donations to help get you a new computer? Yeah, I got, uh, most recently, I got six pounds from this girl who's based in the UK. So that was uh, kind of funny. Um, that's cool. She was, yeah, she was saying she was so happy when she got her new computer recently. So she wanted to help out with mine. Um, but yeah, it's just hard because uh, to Twitch stream, it requires quite a hefty piece of software and equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing I have that supports that is my laptop from high school, which is a PC. <laughs> Um, so it's like yeah. super, super old and the C button doesn't work. So it's hard to type chess. <laughs> um, so it's a bit of a problem, but I mean, it does the job. So I'm, I'm just working with it. I, I love it. I can see somebody out the, on the other end going, Hess? What, what is it? Hess? I, what, I don't get it. What is Hess? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to copy and paste it manually every time I type a C. <laughs> Uh, but you get it done and that's that's all that really counts is that you mm -hmm. can sell and but you know that does illustrate something in that you don't have to have the latest computer equipment to do this you literally yeah. can be using an older computer and still be able to make stuff happen yeah yeah i think the growth doesn't happen quite as quickly but um people will still kind of support and watch the stream and such so mm -hmm. it, it mm -hmm. works mm -hmm. sure uh that's uh that's that's just i don't know that's just really interesting how do you feel um uh how do you feel being in that world yeah it's it's definitely different because i think a lot of people who game well the, the top twitch streamers spend their entire days gaming like they'll stream for about eight hours mm -hmm. um and i find that my streams go most successfully when they surpass an hour but i usually mm -hmm. only have enough time to stream for an hour but i've done mm -hmm. it like two or three two to three hour streams um and that's what performs the best so i think the gamer mm -hmm. community is interesting because they usually only game and that's their their main sort of hobby um, and it's sort of different because they're really tech savvy um, and usually prefer to game as opposed to socialize. Like I've had a lot of viewers um, ask me if I need help with certain things or they'll give me a chess lesson um, or something like that. And then I'll like mention that they can co-stream with me and be on my stream but a lot of them have turned it down because um, they say that they're like really shy and camera shy and um, would prefer not to. They just like to view content because I think it allows them to still feel the sense of a social life without kind of the pressure of being in social situations. Um, so it, it is quite different, um, but, but people are really supportive as a result, I think, because they really look to streamers for the socialization and the social outlet. Do you feel like in the pandemic too, that, uh, that it's become even more important or the people reaching out to things like that more? Yeah, definitely. Because I think they're able to just have touch with people. I think um, I saw a tweet yesterday from a um, partner, or I think he's a principal at a VC, but he was mm -hmm. saying that he's seen quite a bit of an uptick and growth in specifically apps that are geared towards serendipitous meetings between mm -hmm. Gen Zers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's especially because of the pandemic, but also be, but because Gen Z is so used to social media and the network effect of different apps. Mm -hmm. um, so I think anything that it involves serendipitous meetings and um, will do successfully. And so I think with Twitch, people are able to just see suggested videos and then comment. Um, and I think similarly Clubhouse, uh, the new mm -hmm. app, it's, um, it's similar too. And I mean, they were able to reach a $1 billion valuation really soon after their launch. So I think, mm -hmm. I think it goes to show how successful those kind of serendipitous connections mm -hmm. um, that are facilitated can be. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've uh, recently uh, joined Clubhouse a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I followed my, you. <laughs> yeah, you did. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, and uh, literally within a week of my being on, a, the friend of mine who invited me, <clears throat> he called up and said, hey, do you want to do you want to do a room? Let's do a room. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, let's do a room about stuff. And he and I both noticed that 
there was nothing for playwrights, let alone black playwrights, which mm -hmm. both of us are, and we I operate in the black theater world and have for a long time. So, uh, so it's very interesting that among the subjects, lots of subjects being discussed and lots of rooms being set up, but like virtually there was like nothing just for playwriting. So we started, so we decided to start the room, Black Writers Talk Playwriting. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be probably joining that conversation because we're on Fridays at four too, but I'll be joining that afterwards. But it's, I found it really, uh, really exciting, really exciting, really fascinating. And because it's audio only too, you don't have the pressure of the video and having to look good because a lot of people have that but really uh, we had some really engaging conversations and people are coming in and all sorts of really accomplished people are coming into mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. yeah and launch house people are on clubhouse all the time um mm -hmm. because i think right now it's the fastest way to network yes and so um and the discovery is also really crazy because if you're followed by one person who's leading a 5,000 person room, then you're bumped to the top of the feed and then everyone can click on your profile. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, people are big on Clubhouse here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really noticing. Yeah, I'm noticing that. I've, I've noticed that there's a, t a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of businesses, a lot of, I was in mm -hmm. one room, you know, being that I've got a startup too. So I was in one of those rooms and I watched, uh, I literally listened to a, uh, young lady come on and do her pitch and literally one of the investors right there said i'm in for 65k dm yeah. me and, dm me and we'll we'll work out the details <laughs> and i was like yeah what, what? <laughs> you know it was like like that but folks i've seen like mark cuban has been on there you know, mm -hmm. mark Anderson has been, been mm -hmm. on there tiffany haddish has a room yeah. she pops on a lot so uh, it's really interesting because you can actually get to interact with these folks that you might not ever in a million years be able to. Right. right? So yeah. that's, that's, that's really awesome. Yeah. I was very happy to see you uh, on Clubhouse to see you follow me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. Clubhouse, uh, Google Clubhouse, you guys out there. It's uh, something you have to be invited to, and it's only for iPhone users at the moment, although there's a huge demand from the Android community. Uh, so I'm sure we'll be seeing it pop up there too. But if you got mm -hmm. an iPhone, check it out. It's it's really cool, super easy to use too. And, and just really fun, really fun. Yeah. Um, a lot of crazy stuff going on there, boy. I heard some extra, the paranormal groups were saying some very interesting things. <laughs> but in any case, um, so I'm glad, so you're on Clubhouse. So you Clubhouse, you do Twitch. Are there any other networks, any other social stuff that you do? I mean, besides the obvious, Facebook or whatever. <laughs> Um, I mean, I have a YouTube channel and so I post vlogs there, but, um, yeah, that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. I would say I, I pretty much use my, my YouTube as a diary of sorts. And especially during the pandemic, I started it during my first week home. So I think it's been good to kind of keep up with, um, my, growth i guess throughout the mm. pandemic <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely now we have to talk i gotta get we're, we're coming up and uh we're getting close on time here but before and i wanted to see if, there, if anybody had any questions so if anybody has a question out there you'd like to ask please feel free you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll bring you on um but i wanted to ask about uh, your your modeling your fashion modeling and uh, your, your statement piece, and this leads into your podcast because your podcast deals with fashion. It's called a statement piece, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. what, what does that mean? What is a statement piece? What, what's your podcast about? And, and what's, what's this with you and modeling? And fashion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so my podcast, we focus on fashion and pop culture with a business and social justice lens. And so we try to cover topics and have guests on that fulfill at least two of those four categories. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really great because I've been able to meet quite a few people that are really accomplished. Um, and I think I used to feel ashamed about the fact that I have so many different interests because I think a lot of people I know that are um, that I admire, they usually have like one thing that they're focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, and I always felt like I was kind of scattered, but I think a lot of people that I've met in the fashion world, they usually do have many projects going on. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of helped me find a bit of a community. Um, and then as for my modeling, I have been modeling since I was 15 um, because I grew up in LA. So I think, um, I think in LA, there's just so much 
proximity to entertainment and the industry and such that there's always kind of different people approaching you in a target and being like, Oh, mm-hmm. you should model or, um, that happened to a lot of my friends. So mm-hmm. yeah. So I started mm-hmm. then, uh, then I went to Wellesley for school and I signed with an agency in Boston, but the Boston modeling industry is more geared towards, uh, Madewell and LL Bean, mm-hmm. uh, new mm-hmm. balance type of brands. And I think they don't go for my look as much. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I came back to LA for the pandemic, um, I started modeling again, um, which was definitely interesting because as you mentioned, the entertainment industry is kind of slowed because of COVID. Um, Mm -hmm. So whenever I went on set, I just made sure that everyone had gotten tested before and they usually tried to keep the sets outside um, Mm -hmm. and yeah, have minimal contact. Mm-hmm. Here we just brought up a little. <laughs> yeah. So that's in Launch House. And um, I was modeling for a collab that was going on between two companies whose founders live in the house as well. So mm-hmm. one of them is called Boyfriend. Um, it's a clothing brand that a someone started in the house. And it they collabed with a dating app that someone is launching called Lolly um uh-huh. yeah and so i was kind of the face of their collab campaign i guess uh-huh. I, um I, yeah i love the fashion industry because especially the last few years i've been noticing that the, the newer companies that are coming up and the newer lines what the names are just i mean i love that boyfriend what's the name of your label <laughs> your clothing label boyfriend simple yeah dude. i love it you know yeah for sure that's 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 really cool so that's really interesting to see how you know the lives how your work and everything is intersecting in there what was it originally like do you, was there like one aha moment about fashion like when you were 12 years old or 11 years old where you're like that's it i want to do that was there was there one of those moments for you or was it just something you sort of rolled into in high school as you were kind of finding yourself Yeah, I think I just sort of rolled into it. Um, I think being in, I was in a society at Wellesley um, called Phi Sig and Julie's in it too. (laughs) Um, But I I think that really helped me find my style because there were so many um, people in my society that were interested in fashion and I, they became my best friends. Um, Mm -hmm. And now one of them is my co-host and we were presidents of um, of the society together. And so I think that like, especially those kind of friendships really shaped the way that I think about fashion. And I think I never, um, I never really considered it as something that I could pursue professionally because I think the Asian mindset to like education Mm -hmm. and such is that you should abide by like getting higher education and pursuing Mm -hmm. science and things like that. Um, so I never really, validated my own interest but I think Mm -hmm. when I started my podcast I realized that I do actually really enjoy talking about fashion and Mm -hmm. it's um, a really really wasteful industry so I think there's Mm -hmm. a lot of room for things like science to be applied and ethics as well Um, so I think in my podcast I've found that Mm -hmm. I would I would absolutely agree Um, uh, the whole fast the whole fast fashion thing is just is just it's really nuts right that's when you think about it and think about all the ways so that's really that's really great i I like the fact that you're 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 melding your concerns with your with your likes Mm -hmm. and 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 i'm curious because you mentioned the whole asian thing i know from asian folks the mom and dad want you to be a doctor a lawyer right to be successful they want to guarantee but has have you felt anything at all in your life because you're because of you're being Asian in America? Because you know in this country we've been talking a lot, lot about race and troubles and systemic stuff and like that. Have you yourself ever had to deal with any of that, or have you been able to not, hopefully, not have to deal with any of that? Yeah, yeah. I think growing up in LA, uh, because it's such a diverse city and there's especially a lot of Asian representation. I didn't feel so much um, racism, I think, as my friends who grew up in the South, for instance. Um, And so I think I was fortunate that I didn't really experience it so much. Like a lot of my friends growing up were Asian and also Mm -hmm. mixed. Um, So I think when I went to school in Boston, I realized that there it, it is still 
um, quite prevalent. And so I kind of had to educate myself even on social issues concerning my own race um, once mm -hmm. I got to Boston. And so, um, yeah, I, I think I've been lucky in that I've found a community really at a young age. So I mm -hmm. never really felt alienated or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it does happen. That's great. Yeah, it certainly does. And, and Boston is a, has a terribly racist history in the past. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always, unfortunately, had a problem. And to this day, still does have somewhat of a problem with it. But things are getting better, so thankfully. And with folks like you out there, and you mean folks and being out there in the world, I think, I think just your presence alone and your interacting with folks um, helps to move the needle forward. Mm -hmm. helps, to, helps to change things. So I think that's uh, I think it's really important that you're that you're out there, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to you because um, because we feel it's important for that that people like you are supported, um, you know, and are given encouragement and a place to discuss to discuss their ideas and and. Um, because I know just working with you is, uh, and Bridge Strategy, you all helped us out immensely. So, um, so, and that's something that needs to go out as much as possible. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's great to hear. So, yeah, that, that's, really, that's really wonderful. Um, one last question I'm going to ask you then, because we're almost at time. One last question I'm going to ask you about your podcast. Um, and this was, I don't know who, I think one of the staff asked me to ask this question. So, um, who has been your favorite guest on the show so far? Yeah, um, I think my favorite was this influencer, Isaac Hinden Miller. He is known for being a DJ and mm -hmm. a, re a really early fashion blogger in the same wave with Danielle Bernstein and uh, Ami Song. Mm -hmm. But um, he was just really interesting because I think he, as, as a straight man in fashion, he had a really unique perspective. Mm -hmm. And also he had really interesting insights on kind of the transition of social media popularity from Instagram to TikTok, um, and also the content creation process. Um, and he created his own brand called I Like You. And so mm -hmm. it was cool to hear about how he built that out and was able to have it be seen on people like David Dobrik. Um, mm -hmm. So I think he was just really interesting because I think his the way that he approaches pop culture Mm -hmm. um, and the occupation of being an influencer was just something that I had never really heard before. So I, I feel like I learned a lot from mm -hmm. talking with him. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's, that's what conversations are all about. At least that's the way I think. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wanted, uh, you know, in, in our conversations, I learned a lot about you and what you do and how you work. And I, I thought we all thought on the staff here that that it's something we wanted to share with the rest of the world. Kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of part of our effort to, you know, help help move the needle forward away from all the chaos and division, but into, you know, straight up just connecting with people. Yeah, for sure. You know, so that's uh, so that's really, really wonderful. Um, one last question: What advice do you have for entrepreneurs? <laughs> um, for entrepreneurs, I think um, well, one of our one of our bridge strategy clients once told me that if you if you're met with little resistance in whatever you're doing, then it's mm -hmm. definitely what you're meant to be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that always stuck with me because I was really surprised at the fact or at how quickly bridge strategy was able to grow. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was just like word of mouth between our former clients and then also consultants, um, brought us out to where we were able to get to today. And, um, I was just really shocked because it, at, at about, a month and a half into operating bridge strategy, I, I stopped my own outreach because there were almost too many people um, mm -hmm. to manage. And so mm -hmm. I, I was just really surprised that that was the case. So she said that if I was met with such little resistance, then I should definitely keep doing it. And she said that she mm -hmm. felt the same way about her own business um, and things like that. Like she r runs a candle company and it was featured in Vogue. Um, and mm -hmm those kind of opportunities she didn't even seek out. So she was saying whenever she sees that kind of serendipity happen frequently, then mm -hmm. um, she knows that she's in the right place. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's good advice. That, that's good <laughs> advice. Um, look up Catherine Cross, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, Cross, C-R-O-S-S. -S. Look her up. Uh, definitely, if you're in need of a great consulting company that will help you strategize and talk through things and figure some things out that you're trying to figure out, um, whether you be a solo entrepreneur or you've got a startup like we have here at, here at Zoom Catchers, Bridge Strategy and Catherine can definitely help you out. I would highly recommend uh, recommend you work with them. Uh, I'm trying to see. I don't think we have any questions. Is there are there any questions out there? I see we, we have one. I don't think we have any questions here. So um, we'll have to do that some other time. But in the meantime, uh, we're just past five o'clock here, so we are at our time. We meant to be here about an hour. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed yourself, Catherine. Uh, Definitely. <laughs> we, I have enjoyed talking with you. I hope our listeners have out there. Um, thank you all <laughs> for tuning in. This is our very first uh, Zoom Catchers Live virtual event, the first of this series. They're only going to get better. Um, we really appreciate the support. Uh, check us, out, check out our website at zoomcatchers.us. Uh, if you look in the chat, you'll see uh, a place where a link to a survey that you can fill out. We'd like to ask you to take a moment to fill that out and let us know how we did and how we can improve. And if you got anything, any nice things or anything at all you want to say to Catherine, you can you can put that there and let us know, and we'll be happy to pass them on. Um, Catherine, any, any final words you want to leave our, our audience with? Um, I don't think so. Just thank you so much for having me. I love talking about um, all of my interests. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, we, we will definitely, uh, this isn't the last we've seen of, of you. We may have you back in the future, but certainly uh, Zoom Catchers hasn't seen the last of you because you're our special advisor. So, <laughs> and, and you got some special advising to do. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that said, um, I'm going to bid you good night. Thank you so much for joining us here on our very first inaugural Behind the Screen Conversations with the Interesting and Innovative People. And you are definitely one of those people. <laughs> Thank you. You take okay. care of yourself. Bye-bye now. Good night.